Welcome everyone to IRP's Thursday seminar. Um, we are delighted to have uh, Carolyn Heinrich with us today. Um, we have to first say that Carolyn uh, spent time here at UW uh, several years back when I started. She was here um, and at that time she uh, ran the GRF program um, and was an associate director at IRP. So she's very much uh, one of our own and we're thrilled every time we can get her back to campus even if it's just a virtual uh, <laughs> a virtual seminar. Um, Carolyn has gone on to do many great things. Um, she's now a professor at Vanderbilt of public policy, economics, education, and health policies. So you can tell she really can um, do it all. And um, she's going to talk to us today about some work that's actually uh, happened here in Wisconsin, looking at virtual uh, schooling in Milwaukee. So I'm really excited. Uh, quick reminder, she'll take questions of clarification. Um, you can type those into either, uh, I would request the chat function. And by the way, when you type into the chat function, um, you can choose who you're sending it to. So you can send it to everyone such that even the attendees see it. If you don't, I think the default is that only Carolyn and I would see it. So you might want to change that default when you're typing in a question. Um, if she doesn't see it, I can interrupt and, and bring her attention to that question. Um, we're thrilled to hear from you, Carolyn, um, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Catherine. It's exciting to see um, IRP is so, so vibrant and, and under uh, wonderful leadership with you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start by sharing my screen here. Um, so uh, let me make sure that this is full so you can get, oops, this is like how it is for me in class. I have to minimize uh, that. Okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start the slideshow here. And um, Catherine, can you see the uh, cover page? Yep, it looks great. Okay, great. So um, this research is, uh, so the early origins of this are in a research practice partnership with Milwaukee Public Schools, which we started in 2006 and is still going. So we still work with Milwaukee Public Schools. Um, and uh, my colleague, who I, I think may actually be attending as well, um, Emily Huping uh, Chang is worked with me closely on this work and was also formerly an, an embedded researcher um, at Milwaukee Public Schools working at the Wisconsin Center for Education Research. Um, so the title of the talk is, Does the Labor Market Give Credit for Learning Online? Um, we're looking at online course taking in high school and later labor market outcomes. Um, I could not gonna read everybody's names on this um, acknowledgements, um, but importantly, the linking of the, of the labor market data um, was made possible by the JPB Foundation, uh, and um, that's a grant that is, uh, uh, IRP is intermediary, runs that program, and you can see a number of IRP names on this sheet, Lynn Weimer, Stephen Cook, Dan Ross, who've helped us with the linking of the data. We you know, thank our partners at Milwaukee Public Schools, um, along with us there, as well as other um, funders like William T. Grant Foundation. Um, so this study, um, the larger study started in about 2014, and this is um, a particular component of the study which we're focused on. So I'm going to start by setting up the motivation for this work. So um, some of you may be quite aware that uh, this kind of came in as part of No Child Behind, but has been strengthened since then. Um, that we have stepped up our, our uh, accountability mechanisms for high school graduation. So, you know, historically, high school graduation rates were lagging in the latter decades of the 20th century, which is where some of the, you know, no child behind started in 2002, where that pressure to, to look at that and see how we could do better. Um, Dick Murnane, you know, has a study in this where he looked at and, and showed that enrolling for another year of high school was not resulting in an additional year completed, particularly for low-income urban minority students. And of course, um, you know, Milwaukee Public Schools is, is, is uh, what we to be called low resource district in the sense that um, our budgets are continually tight. They have, you know, over 80, uh, roughly 80% of the students there um, qualify for um, free, free or reduced lunch. And um, as you probably know too, um, it's a very, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, many students of, of color there. Um, so basically, you know, 
and no child behind also was empowering states to reduce the gaps between um, you know, race and socioeconomic in terms of graduation rates. And so one of the things that also did was required states to adopt a uniform measure of graduation. So that is the adjusted cohort um, graduation rate. It became, um, a, a, it's a four-year rate that was mandatory for uh, school districts and states to start, to start tracking. So around the time that that, um, 2011, that, that uh, new uh, uh, kind of mandatory way of measuring high school graduation came into effect. Um, credit recovery uh, for credit recovery programs, um, and they're primarily offered online, uh, stepped up into uh, you know much wider use. And so, um, basically, credit recovery. What it means is that students who fail. Um, a course the first time they take it need to repeat it and most of these are core courses right so they're they're repeating them because they're courses they need to graduate and so what uh, kind of came into being is there are a lot of online options now uh, so there are large uh, companies that sell credit recovery programs essentially they're full fully online course taking systems where they include courses and lectures and tests and everything needed for the students to pass and get credit for that, that core course. The content's developed by the, by the companies and they sell the system to the districts, the districts buy them and they can um, send the students to take those, those classes in online format versus in the, the classroom. And so, you know, around the same time that um, we saw this much greater use, stepping up use over time of credit recovery programs, we also saw pretty large increases in the adjusted cohort graduation rate. And remember, this is after, you know, decades of kind of stagnation. So, um, you know, it was, it's recently 2017-18, the most recent measure was 85% um, high since we first started measuring it with this measure. And, you know, one of the questions that has arisen is, does this really reflect, you know, now are we really getting students to get something out of that additional year of high school? Um, and the concern is that we haven't seen the um, student scores on the national um, uh, educational uh, progress measures, the NAEP scores have not similarly been increasing. So, you know, if we were actually seeing greater ac academic su success, wouldn't we see that in the NAEP scores? And the reason why people pay attention to the NAEP scores is because they're not high stakes tests, right? So they're not tied, they're not, you know, managed by districts they're, they're done nationally and uh, so they're also comparable across states um, the other thing that brought Cotterbury's attention is that the increase in high school graduation rates was particularly dramatic in several states and this is there's i'm just giving you a few examples here there are many more so in alabama they went from 72 percent um uh high school graduation rate to 86 percent you know in just two years there Florida went from 63% to 86% in a decade. And there was actually, you know, people who literally were, you know, district minister would say, yes, yeah, we attribute it to these credit recovery systems. They're helping us get um, kids through courses. And so, you know, there is, it's been, you know, more anecdotal, this, you know, supposed link between high school graduation rates and credit recovery programs. Um, but, you know, we also have another paper on this and, in fact, we do find um, online credit recovery does increase um, high school graduation rates and, and, and others have, have found this too. Now, the important point to note is that the, when a student fails a course and then they take a course for, um, on, online for credit recovery, that new grade replaces the failed grade. So they also end up with you know, better GPAs. And the other thing is, is that um, in Milwaukee public schools in most districts, you can't distinguish that final grade as whether it was from online credit recovery or from the original class on a transcript. We know it because we, we have the data um, that we've linked to it. So let me just quickly you know, say a few things about maybe the pros and cons of online course taking for credit recovery. So first of all, it's very inexpensive. Um, the system is, is compared to if you were going to hire, for example, another teacher to run a class, or the students who had failed the courses the first time, it would be far more expensive for the districts. Um, and also the students can take it, they can work on their classes outside of their time in school. 
Um, and, you know, some of the arguments for it is that, you know, you could maybe personalize it and, and that way accommodate special educational needs of students. Um, and the, also the idea is if, you know, if we do help the students uh, to complete those course, core courses and be more likely to graduate, once they graduate, that opens up new opportunities for them to pursue post-secondary education. In fact, we have also seen the immediate college enrollment rate has increased um, about six percentage points since, since no child behind. Um, other kind of cons though, um, or, or detractors is that, at least as we um, saw it frequently implemented, what often happened is, you know, so let's say, you know, remember students are, are failing different types of core courses, um, but they all use the same course taking system and they might all be taking different courses. So, for example, Milwaukee Public Schools, they would designate um, classrooms or, or learning, online learning labs for credit recovery. And then the students go there and they're each working on their individual courses, but they're all students who are failing a course. You're kind of grouping those kids together um, in, cla in classrooms. And unfortunately, we saw that, you know, the students who are more economically, or economically and more academically disadvantaged, both of those two, and sometimes they go hand in hand, um, were more likely to be taking more of their classes um, online. And so, you know, the students are really struggling and are grouped together in these labs where oftentimes the attending teacher you know, it's not possible for them to have content expertise in, in all these different courses. And so oftentimes a teacher couldn't provide that kind of content um, expertise. And so we also were concerned about from what we saw. So we did, in addition to, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the data, but we did a lot of classroom observations. And uh, Emily, uh, who worked with me on this, did a number of them as well. I did, a, you know, <laughs> we ended up with kind of 500 observations over the course of our study. And we saw plenty of, of reason, we had plenty of reasons to be concerned that the instruction might not be as good. You know, we saw students, um, you know, they were what there was a lecture playing online, but they had their earbuds plugged into their phone and they're listening to music. And so not really listening to the lectures. Um, the tests were, you know, multiple choice. They could guess at them or they could Google up Google answers. Um, they could pass through things um, faster. And so that was both an advantage, right? They could get through the course faster. But the question about what they're, whether they were actually learning it was, was uh, a big concern. We saw higher rates of substitute teachers in those classrooms who um, sometimes even know how to help them with logins and things like that. So now remember, this particular paper is focused on after these kids get out of high school, um, what are the implications for them of having done some of their, or you know, for some might make just one or two courses, some of the more courses, have had instruction um, online versus in the traditional classroom setting. So, you know, if our theoretical perspectives are, you know, so does a high school diploma reflect gains in human capital, right? So there's a theory about the fact that education should be um, increasing human capital of students. Um, and then there's also signaling theory, uh, which suggests that maybe it's just a signal of employers who value certain attributes, right, like the, the fact that the student attended enough or persisted to get their high school degree, but are maybe less necessarily reflecting, you know, the quality of their learning or things like that. So this is just a signal of their, of, of other attributes that are desirable, but things we don't actually observe like we can about their grades and things like that. So human capital theory would predict that time spent learning in school will directly increase their labor market wages, right? So making them more productive workers. So if, if human capital theory drives our expectations, we might um, be very concerned that if the uh, learning and online is not equivalent in terms of building skills and human capital, that those students might do worse. Um, if it's a sorting or signaling model um, that factors in, um, you know, things about what makes individuals ready to, you know, for example, do well in the labor market, they might be correlated you know, with whether or not they're taking courses online, but they're not directly determined by them. So like I was saying, um, maybe it doesn't matter that they didn't learn much, but the fact that they um, took the courses and persisted and completed the degree may be more important. Um, so, you know, we know that employers use educational level. In this case would be, you know, knowing that they completed their, their high school diploma to make inferences about characteristics that they, they don't observe. So where does it lead to us in terms of hypotheses? So we hypothesize that, High school students who took online courses for credit recovery 
which again is not observable on their transcript to, to any employer or you know, someone who would be looking at them for admission for a post-secondary edu education institution, they'll have either comparable earnings or you know, if we believe the signaling because they, you know, people say, okay, this is just doesn't matter, they can't see this for credit recovery, all that matters is they completed the degree, um, or lower post-high school earnings than similar high school students who do not take courses online. If we believe that the human capital theory would drive um, their, their outcomes and that we're concerned that maybe they are cheated of some human capital building in those online courses. Um, so our sorting and signaling um, theory or perspective says we should expect no difference in high school earnings, at least initially, right? Um, but if learning matters to workplace productivity, uh, we would expect those online course takers would earn less if we believe the quality of the education was lower. And again, our, our expectations for it being lower was informed by observations that we've um, done of credit recovery program implementation and, um, the, and what we've seen already. So for example, in this work that we, we've done already and, and, and showed that um, you know, we found not only either no or negative correlations between participation in online course taking and for example, their test scores. Um, so that's a concern. And the other point to make is that employers may not ob initially observe which high school graduates took courses online and may not know the difference as long as they have a high school degree. But if they do perform differently on, on the job, right, you might see initially the earnings to be the same, but that they might decline over time. Okay. Um, there's also the factor, right, though, that remember I mentioned that one possible you know, positive is regardless of whether or not they're, they're learning those courses, if it gives them a chance to complete the degree and they um, can then go on to college, you know, that might be a, a, a benefit. So we also break out our analyses by um, whether or not students um, pursued post-secondary education. And so we look at, you know, so post high school, if they, if they do pursue post-secondary education, how does that affect uh, their, their um, labor market outcomes? So I mentioned that we found a small positive relationship between online course taking and um, two and four year college enrollment. But what we did see in this other work was that the quality of the institution in which the students who did their courses online um, was poor. Um, so they were less likely to be you know, ranked institutions, um, you know, more of the for-profit uh, types. And so uh, we had a, a number of, of measures in institutional quality we used to confirm it. lower um, completion rates at those post-secondary post -secondary education institutions. So, they might get access, but it's not clear that they're going to benefit from having access to post-secondary education. Um, but we also have to take into consideration, right, the fact that when you're in college, you may have lower labor market earnings. Another reason for us to, to break up those groups. Um, same time, right, we also know that today a lot more students, even if they're full-time enrolled in school, are also working um, full or part-time. So anyway, let me um, shift to talking about our study settings and data, and I'm going to go over this relatively quickly so we can get to more interesting uh, things to look at. Um, so this online instructional program that we studied um, is used for primarily for credit recovery. It's in all 50 states, um, and it's primarily used, uh, so like eight of the top 10 biggest school districts in the U.S. are using this specific program that we studied, and they're often using it for kids falling behind academically. Um, in Milwaukee Public Schools, we found that students take on average two online courses per year. Okay, so that's in a given year. Um, the 90th percentile is four online courses in a given year. So that, you know, tends to be half of their, all of their classes. Um, right, this is done in Milwaukee. We started studying this in 2010-11, which was the first year they introduced it. Um, they have approximately 67,000 student users each year. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, by you know 2016-17, about 20% of all credits accrued in the high school were completed online, and 40% of the graduating seniors had at least one course online. So that's in that particular year. Um, our data cover this period here, and then um, 2010 through 2018. And as I mentioned, we linked student clearinghouse data and the UI um, earnings records, which was done at IRP. Amazing. Um, really thrilled. Uh, we had a 98.8% match rate for earnings data in our latest match. Um, sadly, that reflects in part, you know, the fact that 
we're dealing with a, a, a very low income um, population in this high school. And so a lot of them had um, administrative data and other uh, sources. Um, so the UIN's data include earnings per quarter, employment, number of employers. Um, and we currently, we have data for, you know, obviously when students graduate affects how long we can observe them post high school. Um, we can some, observe some kids more than five years post high school, but we only go to five years post high school because that's where we have, I think, sufficient sample for analysis. So we focus on um, students for whom we can verify they've completed high school um, in one set of analyses, and we also separately analyze high school dropouts. That was another thing IRP helped us with. We were able to get data from the state on high school dropouts because we didn't feel we could um, accurately identify them in our MPS records. Um, and then across our entire sample, right, all the years, about 37% of high school graduates took at least one course online. We also defined a subsample of graduates um, who had, and also we do it for dropouts, but who failed at least one course during high school. So um, failing a course is not surprisingly the biggest predictor of whether you'll take a course online. Um, so we also limited it to that subsample. Um, and, and so 56% of those who had ever failed a course repeated that course online. Um, and the idea here is we're gonna reduce the threat of a variable bias, right? Because course failure is a really important predictor of who takes it, consistent with this credit recovery focus. And so we wanna limit that to make them more comparable. Um, there were no specific differences in students' rate of workforce participation um, while they were enrolled in high school. We found largely parallel trends in earnings by whether or not they took courses online. That's really important, right? Because um, before they leave high school, um, if there were diverging patterns in their earnings, we would worry about that, about how comparable they were. So you're not gonna be able to see all the numbers on this clearly. Um, the, the full sample of the axis of, of you know, all the students in the high school we observe who are treated means that they took at least one course online in high school. Comparison, they did never took a course online. And then we break it up by high school grads, high school grads who um, failed the course, and then the dropouts. And so what I wanted just to point out to you here um, is that, uh, and I see there may be a question, is that, you know, once I control for high school grad plus failed the course, you see they're much more comparable than, for example, when I just look at high school grads, I don't control for that. So that's important to see. You can see that across race. You can see it across free lunch status. They're much more comparable here. Um, and then GPA, you know, they're more comparable. You can also look at the dropouts. It's, you know, they're doing frighteningly poorly, right? It's, it's, it's pretty unfortunate. Um, so you can see, you know, extremely low um, GPAs. And, um, and then last thing, you can see the proportion that worked um, before they exited high school. And that's actually pretty comparable across, across them. Okay, I think there might be, was there a question, Catherine, or not? Yes. Okay. Uh, Lois is asking, did the students who failed a course in high school but didn't complete online take the class in person, not take the class, or both? Yes, so I'm going to um, talk a little bit very shortly here about this. So when students fail a course that they need to have to graduate, right? Um, there are two options. They can retake it in the classroom or they can take it online. And so as, that's why I was kind of pointing out that on the previous slide that when I look at just the students who failed a course, I think it was the rate was 56% of them would then retake it online. And then the rest of them were taking it in the classroom. We actually did observe, um, we did go to some of the in, in um, person uh, credit recovery classrooms to do to kind of you know observe what we saw there um, so and there's you know certainly big differences you have an instructor there they were smaller classes you know instructor there was walking around the room working with students you know something you didn't usually see in the online course um, taking. did that answer the question I think so <laughs> okay you can ask again um, I'll get to talking a little bit more about that shortly. Um, so this is just to show you, these are um, looking at quarters prior to high school graduation. And this is um, earnings, and this is comparing those who in blue did not have any um, online courses in orange. You can see they're very parallel. So 
Um, obviously, they're they're um, bumpy because you know depending on which quarter and you might be in summer or whatever. But um, they're very parallel, so that's good news, right? If they had diverging uh, earnings, quarterly earnings. Now, also pay attention to the scale here, right? Because um, in in uh, um, in school, right, they're not going to be earning much. So you can see it's a, it's a it's a small amount that they're earning. Uh, I see there's a couple more questions, maybe. Uh, Lois was just saying that uh, you answered her question. It seems we should be thinking about the comparison as students taking the class in person, not mm -hmm. students who are no class taking no class. Yeah, and so you'll see that break. You'll see us breaking that out, and that's kind of why I was showing that they're definitely more more similar, right? Students who failed course. Yeah, so you know they have to. Com these are courses they have to complete to graduate. So they do. If they're not taken online, they're taking them in the classroom. Um, now here are the, here's the trends. So again, you'll see here the pre, I don't know if you can see my arrow moving, but the, you can see uh, where uh, the prior, you know, earnings prior to high school graduation, and then the, the rest are post high school. And remember, now we have a different scale. We're going from 2018. So, um, you know, these look like smaller differences than, than they are because the scale is, is, is pretty big you know, in 2000 um, increments. Um, but you can see the, ter the trends diverge, and this is so, so this is where Lois can see I've got, you know, high school grads with no online courses, and then high school grads um, with online courses, and then the dotted lines are the ones, um, grads failing the credit, um, taking them online, and grads failing the credit, not online, you know, taking it in the classroom. And so you can see still, though, um, you can see the divergence in the, the dotted lines, and you can see a divergence in the, in the, um, solid lines. So both, both show similar patterns. Okay, um, very quick note. Um, obviously a concern might be that, you know, there's some who we don't observe their earnings. Um, and so uh, clearly one part of it is that, you know, depending on when you graduate, we're not gonna observe your full stream. Uh, but there's also a possibility that they might move out of state, employers don't report earnings, or they work in the informal sector. So um, we did a number of analyses to investigate whether missing outcome data differ by treatment status. And um, basically we find that um, students participating in online coursing were seemingly less likely to be missing earnings data, but after we control for their, their characteristics, those differences weren't statistically significant. So they weren't um, predicted by the things we could control about the students, which was quite a lot um, that we could observe. Um, however, we also estimated um, the models, you know, both ways, you know, replacing missing data um, by zero and then, um, you know, using dummies to account for the missing observations. And we showed the same basic pattern in results. And so um, I'm not gonna spend time on that. Um, there's also some research suggesting that, you know, this is about the best we can do, um, but we felt pretty good um, uh, about that not being a big, and also, um, you know, just the, the particular group of students that we are working with were, are, are much less likely to be moving out of state or going to school out of state. Okay, so we have one more, we have one more question. Uh, Becca wants to know why someone would take an online class if they hadn't failed a course. Um, so that is, so, you know, we were careful not to say, you know, 100% of the kids are, are credit recovery, because it could be that, you know, let's say, for example, we observe students who um, might, in their senior year, they might get a job. And so, if they're working a lot of hours, so like one class I was in, the student came in and the teacher told me he was um, working, uh, but he was in on his lunch hour to do a class. And so, for example, um, students who were already, you know, becoming attached to a full-time job um, in their senior year, uh, they give them a way to continue completing their degree, but they're very, very small percent. Is that helpful? Okay. That's one example. Um, okay, so let me just really quickly just point out that this is just to show you, um, you know, if they ever enrolled in college, right, this is the um, percent of, of students for whom in the treatment comparison that we have um, earnings data on. So this is kind of showing you uh, our frequency. And so clearly if they're enrolling in college, we're less likely to see earnings and data, and that varies by treatment comparison. Comparison means, again, they didn't have um, an online course, but they were also more likely to be um, enrolled in, in college. Um, and then this is, so again, you, this is the uh, percent with 
with um, earnings information one year after high school. Um, and when you go down here, it kind of evens off. This is three years after, and you can also see um, kind of you know earnings, how their average earnings compares. So it's just basic information to get you a sense of of where we're observing um, earnings, and you can see the differences for dropouts. So that's a little bit of a complicated slide. Just for the sake of time, I'm not going to spend more time on that because I want to tell you a little about the analysis and, and then get to the results, which is the most interesting part of the talk. So um, we use um, OLS and two stage least squares instrumental variable regressions. Um, of course, this is really important because, as I mentioned, whether they fail the course was a, the biggest factor predicting whether they would take online credit cover, but we, we certainly imagine there are other differences between students who took courses online and high school and those who didn't. So, um, you know, we, we did a lot of regressions, just the usual thing you do to start out with controls for student and school characteristics. Um, but we realized that that won't fully control, adjust for um, selection unobservables. So fortunately for us, um, Joel Tanji had, um, had some early work where he used a very similar approach and others have used it since. In fact, I just recently found another very recent use of the same approach to modeling by someone looking at um, career and technical education, looking at the effects of career and technical education. Um, so what El Tanji did, so we use the variation across high schools in the average number of courses taken by students in each high school on specialty courses. So in addition to you know, online for credit recovery, there are advanced courses, work study courses, service learning, career and technical education, CTE. Um, and we also looked at the percent of online course takers in each high school, as well as average school level student characteristics. So we use these in the first stage model to predict um, who is taking courses online. I'm gonna justify this in a second. Uh, but the intent is to purge the portion of course selection that might be correlated with student abilities. Okay, so why should you believe me? Um, so um, first of all, we saw substantial year-to-year -year variation across and with schools and the percent of students taking courses online, even when there was no difference or little difference in the proportion that were failing courses. And so why is this important? So one of the things we learned is that it was often, um, you know, decisions by school level administrators and staffing decisions that influenced whether or not they were going to have an online credit recovery lab or online um, course uh, taking in that school. So let me give you some examples. So, you know, one of the schools where we observed um, this kind of variation, you know, like one, you know, one year, like half the students are taking and it drops on to 10% and then it goes back up again. Um, and the, the variation was wide, like from zero to 90 some percent of students in a, in a school taking courses online. Um, and so, for example, one, one case, you know, they had a new principal come in and the principal said, I'm, I'm going to pause all online course taking until I understand more about it and what we're doing with it, how we're staffing it. And so in that year that principal came in, they only allowed the kids who had already started to finish and they didn't allow any new um, online course taking. So that was an admin level decision. There also has to be space. Um, and as you know, enrollments fluctuate in these schools. The other thing that's unique about Milwaukee public schools is that students can transfer. Um, so they have open enrollment across the district. So a student can transfer from one school to the next year to year. In fact, I talk to students who transfer every single year. So, um, and they also have some specialty schools. And so there were a lot of these factors. Um, the other thing that I, I, I think I was very concerned about, and this helped me because I asked the credit report program director um, specifically as well as talk to others you know so people are very worried about the students you know wouldn't the students choice matter here well what he explained is that both the schools and the students prefer the online option and there were two reasons so first of all he said the students if they could take an online course they you know almost always wanted it because you could for example um, pre-test out of out of um, components of the class. So you would have less of the class to, com uh, to complete. You could work at your own pace. Like I said, you could, you could work outside the school. You could do things like that. So most students definitely did want, not want to go back to the same class in there and before and repeat the course. They grabbed at the online um, option. And so if they were assigned to it, they took it, is what he was saying. Um, and then for the, you know, like I mentioned, there were some you know, various administrative decisions but it was just much cheaper for the schools. Um, so for them to, as they literally they said to me, to afford a, you know, to make 
room for another butt in the classroom was much more costly than to put them in an online lab or, you know, sometimes I, I saw as many as 70 students um, in, a, in a lab, you know, working on their courses. Um, so anyway, and then, you know, we did empirical analyses, of course, and verified that, you know, the school level demographics and the course offerings and school type, alternative charter, they accounted for more than two thirds of the explained variation online course seeking, and about one third of that was explained by student characteristics, most of which was um, course failures. So, um, okay, you can ask me questions more later if you want. I'll just run through the model, right? So we're predicting the effects of online course taking. We're given student in a school um, using these instruments that I just described to you. Um, we measure them in the baseline year for online course takers or ninth grade for the years for the year who, of those who did not take courses online. And then um, we use those predictive measures of online course taking as instruments where we estimate a plausibly causal effect of online course taking on student outcomes. So there's our first stage. In our second stage models, we have, you know, school fixed, we have some time varying school level characteristics we control for, school fixed effects. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I think I can. I could go on more there, but let me get you to um, the findings and then we can always come back to the empirics. Okay, well, just really quickly, I guess I want to show you that the how did that first stage model perform? Again, that helps you to believe what I'm going to present. Um, so, again, we did these models separately for those who failed the course. As somebody mentioned, yes, that's our, our, our strongest comparison. Um, but you'll see the results don't differ too much whether we do that. So, we also estimated the sub subsamples for whether they ever enrolled in college. Um, so we did pretty well. Um, our Wooldridge's robust test score of over-identifying over over restrictions um, used that to assess whether the model was correctly specified and or the instruments were uncorrelated with the structural error term. You can't necessarily distinguish between those two, but um, it consistently showed that the models were uh, performing well. And we also found that the instruments um, were very, you know, strong predictors as you want them to be of online course taking. So the first stage model F statistics range from you know, greater than 400 to 40. Um, the numbers get, F statistics get smaller when we get to our smaller sample sizes, right? Because we, we look out, we predict by year going out to the fifth year. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give you an overview of the results in a, in a very busy table and then show you some graphics that will make them a little easier to digest. So, um, so what you have here are um, ends, as you can see, we, our sample size gets smaller, we go further out because there aren't as many kids who have four or five years of earnings, depending on when they completed school or, or were taking, exiting high school. There's our OLS, our IV estimates. These are separated and, and these are only IV enrolled in college um, or not enrolled in college. And then the bottom panel is the, you know, whether they failed, a, so controlling for the subsample who failed a course. And so, um, and then this is estimating year by year. So what you can see is that, you know, in both cases in the first two years, their earnings are, there's no significant differences in earnings across the various samples or across the methods. Same thing in our, our more restricted sample here. Um, but you can see as you, once you get to year three, four and five, Statistically significant differences emerge. Okay, and you know here they're they're um, this sample is slightly smaller, right? Because we're only remember I said about fifty six percent of the kids are well. I didn't say how many failed the course, but yeah, it's a smaller sample. Clear, you can see it's about almost half the size as that one. So we lose some statistical significance, um, not when we break it out here, but you can see the patterns are are very much the same, right? In in the earnings. Um, in third, fourth, and fifth year. And they in turn, they, they turn negative and increasingly negative. So, you know, basically what we're seeing is initially um, they're fairly comparable, but over time <clears throat> the earnings um, uh, gaps emerge. And so let me show you this um, empirically. And the little stars on there will show you statistically significant facts. This is just the most basic um, looking, these are plotting the estimated effects. Okay, so it's not you subtract the differences. And here we're just showing the two subsamples, all high school graduates and high school graduates that fail the course. So you can see the patterns are the same. Um, and uh, you can see that you know, the estimated effects are just, you know, not significant initially. And, you know, maybe uh, um, they're always 
below zero for the high school graduates who fail the course. So it's always a negative effect, but they get negative statistically significant as you go further out. Um, and then if we, um, if I break out by whether they ever enrolled in college, here's where you see some interesting patterns. So what you see is that, um, so the blue and the um, gray um, uh, dotted lines are for those who enrolled in college. And then the orange and yellow are those who um, did enroll in college. And of course, our two subsamples here, high school, all high school grads and those who failed the course. And so you can see, I, I kind of chose you know, warm and cool colors to distinguish them. But if you didn't go to college, right, um, there isn't much of a, you know, it's always negative, but it isn't as, as big. There may even be some kind of uptick later. But for those kids who went to college, um, if you were taking courses on online, you did much worse in terms of your later earnings. Um, other findings, um, when we looked by gender, we saw similar patterns, so these same patterns, although they turned more negative um, for males after the first two years of, of high school. And actually, um, those who did uh, best, I, I see there's some questions coming up, um, the females, who um, did not enroll in college and did online course taking fared uh, the best overall. Though you know, no, there's no statistically significant difference. Statistically significant differences for for that group. Um, I think there are some questions. So let me just go through this summary and then I'll, I'll take those questions. So um, we also looked at um, Richard High School online course taking in the quarters they worked. You know, thinking of whether or not this is, um, you know, driven by employment, and we feel we find consistently very few differences in whether employed, which suggests a negative estimated uh, earnings differential that we see there. Those gaps are driven mainly by lower wages. Um, so, anyways, and then the high school dropouts, just because it's just too much to present, their effect of online coursing was always negative in sign. Um, all right, so let me stop and ha have Catherine ask me the questions because um, I would do that, but I'm not seeing the questions that you're oh. seeing, Carolyn. Um, okay, maybe I didn't it was see popping up. It was popping up on my screen. It was like flashing that there were three in the chat, but maybe not. Um, well, maybe my chat window is um, slow, or so. <laughs> <laughs> with apologies, um, no, if anyone know. has maybe a question, yeah. please type it into chat again or raise your hand. Um, or and, and I can just come to the summary, and then we can take yeah, all the questions. Yeah, we can move on. To I can see people. Um, so I'll just do the the summary. So what we see is that so a gap emerges right between the post high school earnings of students who took courses online for credit recovery. And those who did not take courses online, you know, assuming they, and they took their, their recovered classes in the, in the courses in the classroom, regular classroom, um, and those gaps grew more negative over time. Okay, and so they get to be pretty substantial, you know, five, six thousand um, dollar earnings gaps in a year. Um, those who enrolled in college after taking courses online in high school saw the relatively larger earnings gaps, right? So it's really those who, um, you know, completed high school. Um, had taken courses online, tried post-secondary education, and then they, they do more poorly. Um, so one concern might be that any benefits of greater access to post-secondary education that comes through completing your high school um, diploma through credit recovery may not actually pay off later in, in the labor market. Um, and these findings actually re resonate with some older findings of, of Cameron Heckman, who basically say there's no cheap substitute for schooling. So that might be the case. That's one possible interpretation. Um, we also, you know, just acknowledge limitations of our data and generalizability. Uh, this is one school district. Um, one thing I can say is having, having, you know, looked across other school districts as well uh, and talked to others implementing the same program, we think it's used pretty much similarly in other districts. Um, and we actually have complimented Milwaukee Public Schools for being willing to open up um, their schools to evaluating like this. Uh, so, um, and this is the first study that we know of to follow students into the labor market. Uh, and we, you know, one concern is if, if this was more widely confirmed, if we, if we look at this, this could suggest that, you know, online credit recovery programs could actually reduce the value of the high school degree in the labor market, right? So if, if employers are hiring 
these students, because they've got a high school degree, thinking that they're going to perform like they would expect high school, uh, high school diploma higher, uh, holders to, to perform, but they don't do as well, then they might not next time have the same confidence in the high school signal of a high school degree. The challenge is, and so I've had conversations not only in Milwaukee Public Schools with others, uh, is that they all say like, there is no way we could ever like staff the number of classrooms we need to go back to traditional recovery with the budget cuts they've suffered, you know, the impact of pensions on, on, um, on school district budgets. And in our other analysis, we estimated using some, some work that uh, Henry Levine had done that these credit recovery programs just takes into consideration what they pay for the program, their staffing of it, um, and things like that. It's 25 to 100 times less expensive than other interventions um, that have been tried to increase graduation rates. So you can see it's just it's an incredibly cheap fix or way for them to increase um, high school graduation rates and why it's going to be hard to, to you know, say we need to stop using these. Um, okay, so I am going to stop sharing. I can always pull a slide back up um, so I can take uh, questions. I'm guessing there's some in the chat now. Now we have them, yes. So uh, Jeff asks, or he, he's asking for your comment, uh -huh. and he says, it seems like many districts had more experience with online instruction than white one might have thought. Comment. Um, meaning, um, I guess I'm, when you say experience, what do you mean, Jeff? Like experience using these vendors or experience um, having um, online digital programs? Because of I like, can go ahead and allow Jeff to talk. Yeah, that'd be great. There he is. <clears throat> I just, no, I just, just uh, <clears throat> and actually, th this is something that came to me during the DRF seminar, actually. It's just, I didn't realize how much online instruction was going on in sort of the baseline pre-COVID period. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of dimensions on which districts have, had already done sort of, or could have, and, and maybe because it was focused in the pre-period on certain subgroups of students, the, the learning did not percolate more generally with, among the district administrators. But, you know, it, the portrayal in the media was often like, ah, oh, you know, this is some sudden thing that we've never done before, and that's clearly false for a lot of districts. So let me um, put some perspective on that, since we did study digital instruction in a variety of forms, not just this. So, so let me give you some examples. So one of the things we saw over time, which was a positive, is that from the time we first started our study in like 2014, so there were some federal programs, like the federal E-rate program, that made a huge leap in just in the last few years in the um, internet access and speeds at which internet was accessed in schools. So they went from like, you know, just a third to literally 98, 99% of school districts having high speed internet access. So we literally saw this in our data, like early on, we would see how um, even Milwaukee Public Schools and other districts, how um, interruptions like internet, you know, failing, would literally shut down uh, the instruction for, for these kids or if they're using other kinds of digital tools in the classroom. So that got better over time. But that is with kids on campus in school getting access to the mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. Now you've moved kids home, right? And now we, st now we still have those, home dis those disparities on the home front, right? And in fact, in our study, it's in another paper we published, but we found that the kids who were taking their course, who were working on their courses outside of school, right, in this online course taking system, they were mm -hmm. more advantaged and they were also more motivated. So the kids who were, um, out, who were working on their classes, on their online courses outside the classroom were more advantaged in terms of academics, um, economically and more advantaged than the others. So there are still these disparities once you move that instruction to home. And then there's also the case that, you know, now everybody, um, and, and one of the things we argue in this new, new book I mentioned, the GRFs that we have on equity and quality in digital learning, is that, um, you know, we've, so we have not given teachers nearly sufficient training, capacity, and support needed to do it well, right? So, you know, the vendors, we, we, we got data from the vendor to do this, this study so we could look at, you know, we have the details, the micro-interactions, I talked about some of the GRFs, 
um, you know how the students were using the system. Um, but the vendors, and so when we bring these findings to the vendors, they say, well, wait a minute, you know, we, we say these, these things should be used in blended ways. You know, we never advocate just putting kids in labs, you know, on their own in their courses. But then the vendors are selling a tool to these, you know, large, you know, budget crunched districts with more kids with needs, you know, special learnings that they can keep up with, um, knowing that they can't do this kind of blended learning um, effectively. And so, I mean, I still hold them culpable for, for not, you know, either if you're going to do this and, and, and they make a lot of money, right? If you're going to do this selling these systems to districts, you should be doing everything you can to help support teachers being able to do it in the way you know is needed, right, to, to roll out quality instruction. So it's not that they don't know how to do digital, but it's doing it well and ensuring everybody gets equal access. That's really challenging in the pandemic. Um, we have a question from Steve, um, and Steve asks, um, among the enrolled in college subgroup, can you observe college degree attainment or length of time spent in college? Are, earning, are earnings results moderated by college performance? That's a great question, and it's something that, um, so, you know, we, the problem is that um, to observe those those college outcomes, we need to continue following them a little bit longer and systematically. And we didn't feel like we had enough sample size um, to look at that, but you're, you're right. It's, so what we, only thing we could really observe at this time, you know, with enough on enough of the students was the quality of their, um, of their institution where they were enrolling. And like I said, the, that's, that was kind of a separate paper, but that paper showed um, that they were significantly, uh, um, the quality of students was significantly poorer uh, for those that the online course takers were enrolling. And in, and in things, for example, although we don't have enough data um, linked to, to say right now, you know, what was their, the performance for a big enough group of this that we can, we can track, um, we can say that, for example, the completion rates at those institutions were significantly lower um, than that. So, for example, I mean, I was curious about this, too. I was curious to know if maybe, you know, because you took online courses in high school, you might be more likely to, to go for one of those online colleges as well. And, and there were some, um, there were large numbers of, of students who were rolling in several of the kind of for-profit online colleges, and then one of those colleges um, which had a lot of students, but went out of business, um, kind of like, you know, some other ones that we know of that, that didn't, didn't make it. Unfortunately, the, there's a whole group of really excellent studies of people showing that those kinds of colleges, the quality was quite inferior, lots of promises made and not delivered, and that most of them were interested in that group of students because they could qualify for Pell and they could get their, um, their tuition dollars that way. Okay. Um, one more question from uh, Liz. Were the students who took online courses in the study doing so both from home and in school? And if so, do you know the proportion of each? Um, we, we did look at that. That's kind of what I was seeing. Um, and um, I can't remember off the top of my head the fraction because we looked at it also by different groups, right? So um, one of the things that was really useful for us because we, we linked we, were, we got the vent. So what we did was we linked um, the vendor records, uh, which was gave us every interaction each student had in the system, how, how long they were there, what courses they were taking, how we, we look, could look at their progress in the courses. For example, um, if some students were really performing poorly and not making progress, they could have their courses disabled. So we, that means that they have to stop out. Um, so we have measures like that too. Um, so that what we so what we did was we we did um, since we had like you know 10 million plus records we did some analyses where we um, generated prototypes of users right so who was more engaged who was less engaged um, you know who was um, making progress faster in their courses you know on time completion rates things like that and then one of the things we looked at was um, where were they using it you know in the classroom so. The students who were taking uh, the system, using the system outside of the school, 
were were more like as I said before to I think in your husband another question were more more economically advantaged so they had you know their their demographics suggested that there were you know they had more family income so maybe they were more likely to have an internet access at, at home and I can give you some qualitative because again we interviewed teachers we interviewed program administrators we did hundreds of observations in the classroom and so you know the teachers were always encouraging students you know keep working on your classes go home tonight work on it um, but you know the reality of some of these students is they were they were going off from school to a, a, a part-time job or they may not have had internet access um, at home or if they did have internet access they're sharing it with people or they um, and they don't um, they, there was also some problems right um, they they were not lucky letting students take um, laptops home they had a hard enough time um, with the security of the laptops in the classroom so one of the teachers we talked to said um, you know he talked about his laptops uh, stolen one time so not only was buying locks for the laptops in the classroom he was locking his he bought locks for his windows at school so you could keep the laptops. so there were just security reasons that they also um, weren't letting the, the kids take laptops at home so that was you know kind of unfortunate thing is I, I don't think there was equal access to using those, um, those um, using the system outside of school. Now you could say you could go to the library, right, and log on, um, but again, that takes another level of effort. So those the students who were, they also found that um, students who were like in their junior or senior year of high school um, made more progress in the system. So they were kind of motivated to, to finish, you know, get those last credits completed so they could graduate. Um, one more question. Were there differences in outcomes among the different vendors? So this is one vendor. Um, this is one vendor, uh, um, Ingenuity. They, like I said, they use it. They are one of the biggest vendors. They're in all 50 states. And like I said, eight of the 10 biggest school districts. There are some competing vendors. Um, Apex. Apex is another big one. Um, but this was like literally one of the, the, the biggest vendors. Um, and interestingly, I want to mention this because it's kudos to one of my, my grad students. So um, we also were, while we were, you know, watching what was happening in the classrooms and we're seeing a lot of behavior suggesting women engagement, we also saw some things in the content of the courses that were concerning. So we talked to the school district and uh, the doctoral student was working with me. We arranged so that she could actually put together a research team and go in and um, document what was going on in the class in the actual courses. So what was being taught? How was it being taught? So they literally took courses, recorded, um, developed an instrumentation where they looked at uh, curricular relevance and also um, and responsiveness and also looked at um, authentic work, like how challenging, like what kinds of, of types of activities would they do that would challenge, for example, critical thinking and, and ways, different ways of learning. So she developed these instrumentation with, you know, with, with colleagues in our team and then put together a team and did these observations. And we saw some, some very striking stuff. Um, so one of the things that came out of this, which is just currently in progress, is so one of the courses that had a lot of um, disturbing content in terms of how it was presented, and it might be also presented to black students, for example, or, or, or Hispanic students, was their citizenship course. And so um, what we did was we presented the findings from that work and then MPS said, well, we wanna, we have to change this course. And then the vendor um, was participating in discussions and the vendor said, we agree, um, we're gonna change this course and we're not gonna change this for MPS, we're gonna change it for everyone. And so literally this, this um, student's findings, Jennifer Darling Adwana, um, is gonna change the course that is rolled out to, you know, all the, all 50, in all 50 states. Well, and I, I think you're touching on something I was going to ask is to what mm -hmm. extent, I mean, was it the platform versus where the, could you tell if there are just simply lower amounts of work or lower standards for the work? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you so. think about it, you know, think of, like think about trying to, to repeat a science class online. So, you know, you may be taking a biology class and you're going to do an experiment online. And so you're, and I've seen it, like, you know, they show, like, they ask you to measure, like, the volume in this, in this, um, you know, beaker or whatever, and, and you're doing it online, right? And so it's not, it's not real. Um, but, and so, 
it's really hard to get that same experience. And then every, every quiz or test is um, um, multiple choice, right? So it's a little bit harder to promote that kind of higher order thinking, you know, like when you're in a contest of a science experiment um, in this setting. And then, you know, so what could change that for a student? Um, this is where, again, the vendor said, well, we always meant to be blended learning, right? And so we did see, for example, sometimes in math courses, we did see some teachers, you know, going out of their way to, to provide supplemental instruction for those online courses, like, you know, realizing students having a difficulty getting through this mathematical concept and applying it with just the, you know, the online lecture and the practice problems shown there. And so that teacher might then sit down with the student and, you know, provide some supplemental problems, work through it, have them take notes, have them work out some problems with them. But, you know, what limited teachers from doing that for everybody? If you have a classroom of 45 students and you're the only teacher and, every, you know, people are doing all different types of content, it's really hard to expect a teacher to be able to, to provide that kind of support. So, you know, that's what makes it so cheap, right? The fact that you don't have to have, you know, the, the instructors built into the system. And, you know, most of the time, we documented this as well. And this is in the book that we just um, published as well. The fact that the, um, the different roles, right, a teacher might play in, in the classroom. In these, these labs, it was mostly um, kind of controlling behavior of students, right, um, trying to redirect them back to taking their courses, but very, very little actual instruction, um, instructional support. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just going to ask, so for like an English class, there would not be writing assignments? Um, you know, you can imagine they might be asked to, you know, write something, but it's not going to be, um, they're not going to get the, yeah, it's not a graded, it's, it's, it's not um, typically a, a, a graded essay. There's no one on the, the instruction is um, all um, asynchronous, right? So there's no live instructor in the system. The only live instruction that could come up is supplemented in the classroom. And it, this is, this, I'm fascinated. Is there no, um, is there no responsible teacher for a course? Like, is it literally just videotaped um, lectures with problems? Mm -hmm. Do you know? So, so MPS, um, Milwaukee Public Schools, you know, we worked with them, with, with them in a partnership. And so, you know, they, we shared findings as we went along. They were very concerned about some of the things we, we saw. So, for example, they started um, trying to if possible, have students who are all going to be retaking, let's say, a science course, be placed in a classroom with a teacher who also had a background in science, right? So they tried doing that where they could, right? And again, this is where, like I said, most of it becomes administrative school constraints, things like that, that determine whether or not that's going to happen, right? Um, yeah, do you have no. students? Do you have the staff willing to put the time in and coordinate that type of thing? But, you know, this is the other kind of sad thing about it, and this is documented in, in another paper we have, is that, like, you, you, you know, we were talking about the fact that most of the, the tests and the, and the quizzes are, are uh, multiple choice. And so we saw over time was, you know, students could disengage from the, um, from the video lecture, right, be doing other things. And then when the quiz popped up, you know, they could, cut and paste, there was nothing to stop them from cutting and pasting those questions and just dropping them in Google and see what the answer is, right? And then um, over time, we saw that it looked to us like the students were going to specific sites. And you're not surprising if this is out in all 50 states and these are high school, mostly high school students using it, they figured out there were like places you could go to with question banks. And so it was even easier to pass the, the test, right? Once you knew you could go to specific sites and look for answers. Um, and there were other things too that kind of happened over time we shared with uh, Milwaukee Public Schools like so they say they, they were worried about too many students failing the the even with that knowledge right that they could google for answers students failing the quizzes and tests in the system so they set up a system where they said before the, the students could submit their quiz or test for grading they had to ask the teacher for what they called a check, right? So the teacher would have to check to see where they, so the teacher could actually see before they submitted it, like how many right and how many wrong they got. 
And then if the student was clearly going to fail, the teacher would say, sorry, you know, keep working because you're not going to pass if you submit that. But what we saw over time was the teachers, you know, so let's say a student would say, the teachers say, no, you have, you only have four out of 10 right. And so the student, you know, goes through, changes some guesses, and they're like, no, now you have five out of 10 right. And the student doesn't even choose it. Uh, and, and, they, and then they're like, okay, it's this question number, this question number, this question number that you, you don't have right. And the student asks again, and the teacher says the answer is, you know, and submit it, you know, it's because they, they've, they've had all they can, can take of that. So we reported that to um, Waikiki Public Schools, and I watched the credit recovery program director go right from there to a, a professional development session and say to the teachers, you can't give answers, right? Yeah. You're disciplined for that. But, you know, so what they tried to do, what they were trying to do was actually just, the students were not, you know, just guessing rather than, than taking that seriously. They told them to take notes. Um, you know, we, we documented how many were note taking, and often it was just, you know, maybe a kids in the whole classroom that would be taking notes. Yeah, and I guess I meant to ask if there was no like instructional assigned teacher on the mm -hmm. online platform, not in the oh, right. school system. Yeah. Like, is there any, because I could imagine if it really is sort of like all asynchronous lectures yeah. and multiple choice tests, like you don't actually need a teacher once you get it set up, right? Yeah, well, I mean, and unfortunately, that's what I was kind of saying. Um, the labs were often, you know, the role of the, the personnel or staff in the classroom was more to make sure students were logged in, students were working, not talking right. with their neighbor, goofing around, um, rather than doing any kind of content. Now, I, I can also say that... But was there someone uh, on the back end, like on the online part that would be like, oh, someone hasn't shown, okay, there's like literally no teacher that's tracking participation. No, no or... it's, yep, it's all basically, um, yeah, and I mean, so it actually allowed uh, uh, Jennifer, the graduate student I mentioned, to do some interesting things, like, for example, she could, she documented the race of the instructors, you know, because there's this idea that representation matters, and so it was able to think about whether, does it matter just because um, the color of the person's skin, or does it matter because they interact differently? Because there's no yeah. interaction happening, right? So you can kind of test test yeah. whether it's just it's that. But yeah, so there's literally no interaction. It's all kind of canned content, which was, I think, another thing that disturbed us, right? That you're just buying wholesale all these courses from you know a, a for-profit company, and exp with the expectations, of course, they're selling it, right? That oh. They sell it like this meets all the common core standards and things like that. So, right, right. If the students are paying attention to it, they are. Well, I want to thank you. I, if there are, I'll wait a second to see if there's any more questions. That was really great and timely <laughs> given <laughs> online instruction and um, localized, given that we're all in Wisconsin. So, I really appreciate your uh, virtual attendance or virtual visit. Um, I just want to right. say if anybody is like interested in or working, I know I, I met the GRFs for quite a few education um, students there. Um, if anyone's interested, we have a website. We have, we made all our instrumentation that we developed over the course of many years free. Um, we encourage districts to use, we, we know districts are using it. We develop instrumentation that they can use some shorter tools, some longer tools. There's these other apps. We encourage more people to do it. Like I said, we did it in Milwaukee, but we need to do this in a lot more places to understand, um, especially now with this pandemic, it's, it's all over. Yeah. Well, great. Um, thanks, Carolyn. Be yeah. well. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, um, all of you who stayed through the end. And um, wish I could have been there in person, but hopefully to be on campus in not too long again. Okay. Thank you. Bye.